So today, we're really, really fortunate because in just the last couple of days, Glenn has volunteered to give a slideshow of Joe's place. And he has grown many interesting and unusual plants and has amazing, uh, an amazing collection of irises in his yard, which is near here. Um, he joined the club just last September. And um, this was, and, and when he did, he offered to give irises to the club and also to show his yard if people were interested. And several of us did make it there last August. It's really beautiful. And he has many, many types of irises, which hopefully we'll see pictures of today. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, let him take it away. He's gonna introduce himself. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mike. Does that sound? Okay. Good. I'm reminded of all the substitute teachers that we gave help to back in school days. Uh, shoes on the other foot. Um, a little bit of history. I think I may have mentioned some of this last September, but uh, kind of got my start in gardening at age 12. Um, my mom had a Brex catalog lying around the all the bulbs. I was looking through that. So, wow, this is pretty neat. So I decided to do something with that, and uh, so I built. Uh, it was probably a six by six by six raised bed from bricks and mortar, and I had no I had no idea how to professionally put down mortar on bricks. So it looked like hell. But <laughs> the bulbs in it. Oh, and I stole dirt from the empty lot down the down the end of the street, which um, I didn't get in trouble for, but my parents got uh, <laughs> um, yelled at once for that. Uh, anyways, yeah, the tulips and the daffodils came up great. And that was the start, but I didn't really have a chance to do much more gardening until getting a house uh, in 1985. We're in Tewksbury, and um, <clears throat> then I neglected my children and spent most of my time digging holes in the yard. <laughs> filling them. I rented a little backhoe, um, a bobcat at one point, and dug like probably eight gardens all around the property. It looked like uh, Beirut in the 80s. <laughs> Some of those roads. Um, and so that was uh, my start of uh, diversifying. One of the first things I did, I know I told this last September, was um, my mom had Dug up some of her old uh, heirloom irises, I'll call them the light purple ones. Um, so they're still around in many places, used to be everywhere. Um, they've been lying out of the ground for I think, a couple of months. I brought them up to my house in Duke's Derby. So, what the heck, I'll put them in the, in the ground and see what happens. And next spring, they, the whole thing was covered with purple irises. So, um, so that worked out well. Uh, and, and we moved to Westboro in 1995, and uh, I carried on. We had somewhat better soil now. Uh, probably have about 15 beds now, mostly perennials, uh, one vegetable garden, and then we interspersed that with annuals um, as, uh, as, as appropriate. Um, so I have... Uh, some of the, let's say, less common perennials and annuals covered in this uh, presentation, but everybody knows about petunias and, and zinnias and marigolds, and those are great, you know, they have their, have their place. Uh, some of these, hopefully some of you haven't seen before, and might give you some ideas for that might be good to try. <clears throat> I do get a fair amount of stuff uh, by mail uh, from all over the country, and this year I growing delphiniums from seed, and I, the seeds come from New Zealand and the United Kingdom, uh, where uh, they're more commonly um, propagated. <coughs> and even some lupin seeds from UK also. You've seen in, in Lowe's the very brilliant, uh, very big spike lupins. Uh, you, you may have noticed they're called West Country lupins. 
uh, that is out of a particular nursery in the UK. And um, I was able to get some seeds from there. They only sell in the UK, but I had a friend in Northern Ireland who bought some for me and then um, probably violated planting for restrictions. <laughs> Um, so I have some of those coming up, we'll see how those do. Um, and I'll, I'll have more on, on that one later because there's a good reason to start some of these things from a seed because they're hard to, to get um, in good form, as I'll talk about some more. Uh, so the name Fox and Friends came to me in this political age. So there are some, uh, some puns here in this uh, front page or on this title slide, I'll let you figure it out. Uh, hopefully no one is offended by that. So these are the perennials, which we'll cover, if I'm permitting. Uh, I think there's 19 different ones here. And then there's about, um, after I finish these, we'll do, there's some annuals, some biennials, and some, what I'm calling replants, in particular gladiolus and dahlias, which you have to dig up because they're tender to dig them up every year and then replant them uh, in the next May or so. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I will have this presentation available on a PDF for anyone who wants it, or we'll send it to everybody if not people want it. Um, in case you want to look at the picture some more, or there's a, there's a summary table also as we get towards the end. Uh, now, you'll see every one of these is going to have some pictures with it. Um, where possible, I use my own garden, but sometimes, like I didn't know I was going to do this presentation uh, three days ago, actually. Um, so I don't have all the pictures I, I might need, need. Also, some of them, um, there's a few plants in here, and I'll mention them. I have only a little bit of experience with, so I'm not yet sure. If I do this presentation again a year from now, I may cross some of these out because I mean, if I meant that that's not hardy enough, or it, you know, it looks great in New Mexico. But these Agastakis are desert plants, um, and they're, they're hardy enough. But um, I'm not yet sure how well they're going to do in my garden. I've had um, a few years' experience. Some of them have done well, but then they've died a couple of years later, <clears throat> which doesn't rule things out. Some of the, some of the things do are just short of the perennials that you have to look at. So, um, you can find these uh, in many places, um, but some of the more unusual varieties you have to get by mail. Uh, and later on, we'll have in that summary table uh, suggested sources for the plants. Uh, as you can see, the hummingbirds like this one. Um, I have the symbols up here sun, rabbit resistant, deer resistant. Um, I started putting uh, attracts pollinators icons up there too, like butterfly or the hummingbird. But pretty much all of them have that. That's the function of the flower. So I took all those out. It was taking too much space. <coughs> I should also note that nowhere will you see groundhog resistant. <laughs> as far as I can tell, they eat anything and a lot of it. Um, but it's interesting if you go on the web, you can easily find a bunch of choices for rabbit or deer resistant. There's no groundhog resistant icon, so uh, that probably clinches it out of the way. Uh, so these bloom in the summer. Uh, height varies. Spacing. Uh, I'll probably skip over these as we go through because I'll get repetitive. So far as I know, though, I haven't seen any pests or disease, so that's nice. Some of, the, some of the other ones you'll see I do have quite a few problems. And as I said, it's a desert plant, so it's quite drought resistant. Now, if you do go online and, and try to buy these, pay attention to the hardiness zones because some of them you say, well, that looks great, and you buy it. Well, oh, it's only good to zone seven or something. But there is a, a good variety of colors in, uh, that are hardy to zone six or five. And the pronunciation, you might be inclined to say agastache, which is my first thing because it looks like mustache. <laughs> Supposedly, the, uh, it's from a Greek root, uh, and it should be agastache, like a hard C. And stocky, 
can remember it because it's, I think it's the root of the word stalk, yeah. and aga means many stalks in Greek, apparently. So aga stalk is the right way to say it, but of course, you can say it however you want, and people will probably know <coughs> These are reviewed in alphabetical order. Now, Coryopsis, lots of Coryopsis. There's probably eight different kinds easily. You can find it lows over the course of the summer. Um, <clears throat> oops. This particular one um, makes a very nice uh, bush and has a nice light lemon yellow color, unlike the more common, which is kind of a, a medium yellow, darker. <coughs> A very long blooming season starts in the summer and goes till till the frost kills it. Two feet high. The only problem I had with it was uh, when it was small that the rabbits would take nibbles out of it. That's also fairly common. They seem to like tender shoots. It's common with a lot of things, even delphiniums, as we see, which are, are poisonous. It's supposedly more poisonous when they don't, but they still nibble on them. I haven't seen any uh, diseases yet, and drought resistant once established. And it's important to remember, pretty much in all cases, even the desert plants, they're drought resistant when they're established, when they get the roots deep in the soil. So you might think, oh, I'm buying Agastaki, this is a desert plant, I don't have to worry about watering it. Don't do that. Um, same thing with irises, actually. I it lost a bunch of irises. And I don't think it was because of the cold winter, but because it was so dry and missed, summer, and I don't think I've watered them enough. And uh, I, lost, I lost quite a few of my eyes presents. This one, uh, well, well, we'll do sources later. This, now this is an interesting one that I only came across last year at Briggs Nursery in Attleboro. This can be in <coughs> part shade, uh, and I've seen some places say even to Full sun and full shade. This is, it doesn't quite count the picture, but it's really an electric blue. It's, it's, it's um, really glows, especially in the shade. Uh, Corydalis. <coughs> There's other colors. I've only tried the blue one, though, called porcelain blue. Um, it doesn't look like it made it through the winter, although it was hard enough. But I like the blue so much, especially in shade where it's hard to get color sometimes, um, that I'm going to definitely try it again. Um, Briggs and Attleboro is the only place I've seen it locally, but you can get it by the mail, through the mail by, uh, uh, from a number of different places. I did not have any pest problems, although online it says slugs and snails can uh, attack it. I haven't seen any diseases. It did say it's short-lived online. Short-lived, it's perennial, so it's going to be maybe only a couple of years. It should be more than one year. Sometimes it doesn't even do that. Uh, and hopefully three or more. Okay, delphiniums. This, this is probably my, I don't say it's my favorite plant, because blue is my favorite color. And there's nothing, nothing like this delphinium blue. Some of which you can see here. And there. Uh, now this plant right there is the biggest one. That was about this high. So more than six feet tall. It the, it was at the base of the pyramid. It was like this wide. It was just uh, chock full of blossoms, as you can see. This is, uh, I'm pretty sure this was the blue jay Pacific giant type. Um, and this was in 2016. This is a short lived perennial. So the first year, it wasn't nearly this big. The second year was spectacular. It was also in a hole where I had had a peach tree come down. And I dug out the roots. So that it, like, a, a hole this size of all soft dirt. You load up a lot of manure with these because they're heavy feeders. And, um, like and furthermore, my compost bin, there's the edge of the compost bin, which has some water leaching through it. So there's additional nutrients leaching down into the ground. So I think if the fitting's ever going to do well, this is the spot for it. And sure enough, I 
produce some giant affinities. But most of these were dead the next year, even though they look like a picture of health. Yeah. So that's a short lived perennial. And as far as I know, the people I talked to around here grow delphiniums, that's far from the course in this area. They apparently do like cold winters, though. I've seen ones in Jackson, Wyoming, that made a push this, this far around with shoots coming up out of the ground. Really cold winters. Do you see them coming up from seed? <clears throat> uh, I, I don't, no, I don't think those are from seed. I think they were spreading by the, by the roots. Because they do make clumps. Um, yeah, the first year it'll be less of a clump, more of a central stalk, but then the next year uh, I'll have some coming up. I mean, these 10 stalks coming up. Uh, so the, uh, the Delphinium blue is the classic, but there's also the light blue you can see here, and uh, some very pink shades, and also some light and dark purples. Uh, there's a kind of a purple one there, and then another spectacular white with a black bee, that's called the center slope of bee. Most varieties you can get a white or dark bee. So if you have a white bee, this is like a pure white flower if you like that look. I like the one with black in the middle. This is called black eyed angels, actually. That one. Now, um, I list a lot of pests here, but they're not too bad, really. Um, when they're first coming up is when they're most vulnerable. And I believe I have holes that have chewed on the little sprouts coming up. I've heard reports of rabbits. And online, I've seen reports of slugs and snails, but I haven't seen that myself. But just when they're sprouting, they're first coming up in the spring. And that is early spring. That is even late March, they're starting to poke up. So these are, are quite hardy plants. What do you do to protect the little sprouts? Do you put any fancy I, uh, So I put down vole repellent and pellets. I spray it with um, rabbit repellent. I put down slug pellets. The only thing I've really seen is, is voles there. Um, but I've not, I haven't actually seen the vole something on this one. And they come out of night a lot too. So. Um, there's a fellow, I was mentioning another guy growing defiliants. He said he's seen rabbits eating his, but I haven't seen any rabbits in this area, so I think it's a little in my case. Yeah, I know, I've got rabbits, but I haven't seen, oh, right next to the house. Yeah, because these are right next to the house, these ones. And I've seen those tips chewed off. Not further than they are, I don't believe it. But, and, I, and I know, and I have seen voles back here. I, chipmunks, I think, will damage the roots, but I, I don't think they have the foliage. Yeah. So if they're tunneling right there, they could kill the plant. <laughs> oh, uh, just last year I saw, I put the mites under disease, I guess it could be under pests. Um, the, the heads, the flower spikes can get, a little, can get deformed if you have mites. You have to watch that. That was the first time I noticed it last year. So I'm going to watch this year if I see any indication I'll probably spray it with this, but it's like this up. Not only do they have beautiful colors and, and can be very large, they also rebloom during the season. So in the first year, since they're just getting going, they'll probably only bloom once. But like the second year, um, the initial spikes will be, can be huge. And then the second ones will be somewhat smaller, but still, still quite nice. So they're, um, you get the finny blooms all, all season long, pretty much. Ah. And then uh, staking, okay, that's, so that's a drawback. You can see there's so many flowers up here. If you get a hard wind or where they get soaked with rain, the, the weight just you know, five pounds, you know, over they come. And I usually find myself saying, oh, I should have staked yesterday. Because <laughs> yeah, it looks so good without the stake, and it, it's right there, and they may be this high. Um, uh, so at least take pictures of them. <laughs> you don't get around to because I had I had something like seven feet of, of purple varieties over the the roof line of my shed. And I said I got to take a picture of that, and I did. I came back the next morning and they flopped over. I couldn't take the picture. Of 
echinacea. Now you've probably seen more and more of these around there. Probably everyone's seen Cheyenne Spirit, which is a whole mix of colors. Um, and as I was telling Robin last August, um, you can buy in individual varieties. And I like that much better because then you, when you look at it in the garden, you can really focus on the color. When they're all together, it's like they're individually nice, but it just looks like a olive block. So, so here's three individual varieties. A lot of these can be found at the, at the home stores um, and the nurseries. Western Nursery has a good selection, um, as do other nurseries, and on, uh, online also. But a uh, really nice color range. There's, a, there's yellow, but I haven't put here. Kind of this cantaloupe. Uh, orange, uh, some very beautiful reds that have multi, multi hued reds, um, very deep reds. And then these are the double scoop variety with a big pom pom in the middle. Um, and uh, if, you, if, you, if you think I have, I don't remember seeing those when I was growing up, it's true. Uh, these didn't really start hitting the market, all, all these fancy colors, until the early 2000s. Um, there were new breeding programs between the yellow uh, coneflower found in the Ozarks and the conventional purple one, which is ubiquitous. Uh, and that allowed them, those genes allowed them to mix and match the colors and get, um, get all these amazing hues. I've only been putting a lot of these in the last two or three years. I'm not sure about their longevity yet. I haven't seen any diseases. They are drought resistant when it's, when it's established. The rabbits nibble on them a little when they're small, but otherwise uh, they're pretty much left alone. Um, the flowers last a long time, so um, very, very useful plants. There are short and tall varieties, some are this high, three feet high. They make nice clumps. <coughs> Yeah, echinacea coneflowers also. What was that? <coughs> False indigo is another one that's seen a lot of color diversification in the last few years. Um, the conventional is a kind of a light, medium purple. Very long-lived plant. Kind of one that's at least 20 years old now. Doing just fine. Um, more recently, though, um, we've had yellow varieties come out like that. Lemon meringue is a typical cultivar. Um, this is strawberry lemonade, I think, or raspberry lemonade. Uh, there's also straight pink variety. There's a white variety. Uh, there's a dark purple variety. Um, so I put in. Uh, a bunch of those different colors now, and uh, we'll see how they, so far they're looking good. But these yellow ones are very nice, they make a really nice uh, shapely bush. Um, I like to put them like in the middle of some of my gardens, because they're a nice centerpiece, and then I put stuff all around them. Um, and even after the flowers are gone in the spring, uh, the, the foliage is very attractive and the seed pods are very interesting. Also. These have all the like the black seed pods, like the, yeah, the yeah. Ones. They kind of like big peas in a pod, yeah, kind of. They make a great um, Halloween wreath. Yeah, there you go. Because they're black. All seeds plants. Really cool. um, do these have like those big, knotty uh, root corns under the ground, like the um, nuts? I haven't dug one up yet. <laughs> oh, so I'm really, not sure. They're really hard. They to don't move. like being transplanted. Yeah, they don't like being moved at all. Deep, 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 deep. Yeah. 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 I had to move some, and it was just really hard, and it didn't do very well when I moved. Like I said, I have that one that's 20 plus years old. I never tried to move it. Right. <laughs> Probably it I'm not going to try to around. That's interesting. Yeah. So they are heavy moving. I haven't seen any pests or diseases. I haven't seen anything. Oops. I haven't seen anything chew on them. Um, very long lived, nice garden, garden anchor, as I mentioned, focal point. Blue 
flax. Chlorose is a wildflower in many parts of the U.S., but it's not a native. Um, these I have started from seed only. Uh, last year they bloomed from starting in May until the frost. Uh, pretty amazing. A, a real nice sky blue color. Sky blue to deeper blue. Now when it's when it's hot out, they'll fade around noontime. But as it's cooler, like in September, they'll be open all day. Uh, attractive foliage. Uh, and um, I haven't seen any diseases or anything chew on them. Well, the rabbits a little when they were young. Uh, also drought resistant. <coughs> So I say direct sow in early spring, but also self seeds. I've got to have a bunch of these at the plant sale because they self seed. Um, attractive foliage, kind of a blue green, as I mentioned. Uh, so you can get a nice swath of blue for, for much of the growing season if you, if you put these down. So is this the flax that they make linen out of? The it's related, yeah. L linen is the genus. Uh, Forget the I'm spending the species names, um, but uh, also uh, linseed oil, which sometimes get paint stores they used to use for thinning oil and paints. Um, do they like full sun or shade or what do they like? These oh. like full sun. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I have. I have some that are in a little bit of shade, and they they look okay too. I'll see how they do this year. But the ones that, that have done the best for me so far are the full song. Hollyhocks, traditional cottage garden plants. Uh, long bloom season. Uh, had one last year that was over eight feet tall. Put that out late, probably. Just kept blooming all the way on up. Um, and that was from a seed, so it, by the time it was big, the Japanese beetles were already gone. So I've seen Japanese beetles destroy these plants. Uh, but I missed, I missed the season uh, uh, last year. But yeah, you do have to watch the beetles a little. They'll take it all if they can. There's the powder puff variety. Here, doubles. And then singles. Singles are a lot hardier and will reseed. Uh, I don't. I don't know if the powder puffs we see. They're uh, certainly less prone to it in any case. Other than the Japanese beetles, though, um, I haven't seen anything chew on them. Uh, so they're nice because of the height, obviously, back background plants, or next to a garden shed. And they're easy to start from seed. Japanese iris. These, um, as they say, like wet feet. They like moist ground during the growing season. Well, supposedly not so during the winter, but I can tell you it's still pretty damp here in the winter at my house, and they seem to be doing just fine. They spread quite a bit, actually. These roll came as single rhizomes through the mail, like you know, maybe that big. So they're uh, this one. That might be ten years old. This one. This beautiful purple. Uh, this white one is really cool. The, the folds that come down, and they're quite large. They're like this big. Uh, so it's a really spectacular display, and a lot of them have very intricate. Uh, veins in the petals. So really interesting to look at up close as well, as well as a massive color from from a distance. Are these related to all the Dutch iris? Dutch iris? Yeah. I, I mean, think I so. Uh, been... Dutch iris are bulbs, right? So yeah, these think... are these are rhizomes that run run out into the ground. They're more more similar to the Bermuda iris or Siberian iris. These are pretty 
closer to the edge of Siberia, I also looks at the, the um, rhizomes of quite similar, as does the foliage. And the Siberians will come as the next. Um, now, in terms of pests, uh, iris spore is typically associated with the tall bearded iris that have the big fat rhizomes. These ones have much, much thinner rhizomes in the ground. Uh, so the borers don't prefer them, but I have seen borers, iris borers in these. If you've ever had iris borers, and maybe you haven't, it's not hugely common, but um, they can wipe out your rhizomes. I just I got a bunch of iris. So if you see your stalks just start falling over for no apparent reason, um, try to look at where you'll see the rhizomes coming rotting at the point at the base of the stalk, and look in there. Sometimes you pull it away, and you see a grub just pull back into the hole. But if you see a big kind of round hole like that, it's probably what it is. Sometimes you can stick a pin in it and pull them out. Yeah. I've dug them up. You can wash them. I've dug them up and put them in water, and then the grubs. Flip to the top. No, on my, um, what was it? My vegetable, my zucchini, and mm -hmm. my summer squash. You get the so vine bores. Vine bores. Vine bores. Those are different. I, yeah. I take about literally the pair of yeah. um, needle nose pliers yep. and pull them out. And then I'll yeah, take you can try that. Yeah, you can use some of the same techniques there. Um, but yeah, I have I have to submerge the whole rhizome. Really? Then the bore is, oh, I need to breathe it. Crap, it flew on top. Up. But then you've, you've dug up your rhizomes, you've got to, you've got to completely plant them, and then maybe you've lost a year of blooming. So it's kind of um, extreme surgery, you know, but you can save the rhizomes that way. Sometimes you just say, oh, I'm going to just buy new ones. Yeah, can you treat it with, you know, sepsis or anything like that? Yeah, I've used, um, online it says to use, uh, I think it's called Merit. It's, it's the, the grub, a grubicide, okay. pesticide that's in the lawn fertilizer that the Scots that you buy, for example. <laughs> Now, if you're an organic gardener, I'm not sure you can you have to use manual methods. But if you don't mind the lawn fertilizer, then you shouldn't mind the fruit viruses either. Uh, oh, Japanese beetles, look at that. So the Japanese beetles like the Japanese irises, not surprising. <laughs> not as bad as the um, as the hollyhocks, though. I, I haven't seen them on mass <laughs> native England if it wasn't really infestations. Uh, more Probably the most destructive thing, though, is the voles sometimes in the winter will dig out tunnels in there, and I think that then they eat the rhizomes too, apparently. So I don't think they really like it because they, it's not like all the voles are attracted there, but they can wipe out a, a fair amount of the rhizome over the winter. And um, yeah, they won't kill it, but you might have a bear patch instead of a full, full plump. Uh, I said moist, uh, wet feet, so moist body conditions during growing season. Clumps will spread nicely, as you can see here, and these are very long-lived. I mean, this is this is dying off. It's continuing to live long and prosper. Are these prone to dead zoning in the middle of the clump? No. No. This, uh, you know, you can't really see it. There's a bit of a space here, but only because I dug out a clump and moved it over. I moved another clump to the back. These are not dead zoning at all. And I haven't seen those Siberians either, which is the next slide. The Siberians are typical of purple and some white, but there's a lot of other nice colors out there too. Here you see a nice lavender that's made a nice clump. And this is a navy blue. This one's my favorite. It's really it's, um, kind of small, but it's it's really beautiful deep navy blue. Do you know the cultivar name? No, I wish I did this. <laughs> but uh, as you'll see, there's a, you might be able to find it um, at one of the sources I've listed, which is called Ensada Gardens, which you'll see in the summary table later. That's in Michigan. Uh, they have a lot of Japanese and Siberian irises at reasonable prices. So this is the, some of the tall bearded irises uh, that we'll get to see when we tour my garden in the first week of June, hopefully. Uh, very wide color range. It's an example shown here. And a lot of eye colors as well, like this and that. Uh, 
Uh, there's no true blue, but there's some um, pale blues uh, and uh, some purples that are very bluish. There's orange, there's yellow, there's pink, maroonish, dark purple. Um, there's no true red either, but there's maroon. Uh, there's brilliant yellows, uh, white. So uh, the Twelve Beard Iris are one of the um, greatest color ranges of, of any of the flowers out there. Uh, a decent blooming season, late May to early June for a few weeks. Um, yeah, these are the Twelve Beard. Now we saw that the Bee Warburtons, you know, they were you know, maybe 12 inches or less. Uh, I'm not quite sure where tall leaves off and there's mediums, but. Anyway, I said 24 to 48, so some of them do get quite high. Iris borer is the main problem, but you can get some bacterial diseases which can rot your rhizomes or, or put spots in your leaves. The borer, I found, is, is the worst one if you get an infestation. Uh, you can keep the, the rhizome rot down. Um, you want to make sure you don't over water. They like to be, for example, on a mound or a slope. They don't have to be, though. I've had them do quite well in, in other places, but, but uh, don't water them quite as much as other things that, that uh, I do like to water, like Siberian irises or Japanese irises. Drought resistance once established. Oh, but, yeah, many, many, many of these irises have real nice fragrance to them. Fruity. I have a purple one that I swear smells like grapes. <laughs> it might be my imagination just because of the color. <laughs> uh, these clumps spread too. Not quite as, well, some of them are quite robust too, actually. Uh, some of the fancier colors, though, they, they don't spread as robustly as uh, some of the uh, plainer colors. But they are long lived. Yeah, I have some definitely um, at least 10 years old, probably 15, and they're still spreading. So. Yes. The most well-known one is the red cardinal flower here. And uh, if you go to Garden in the Woods, they have quite a few of these. But the ones I saw there were like this big. And these can get like six feet high if they're in a good body spot. This was at my yard last August. And Andrea and Rod. Maybe a robin took the picture. <laughs> but you can see some of the um, tall cardinal flowers there. That one's back behind Andrea, so you can see it's taller than she is. Is that whole plot mobilia? I'm sorry? Is that whole section mobilia? Is it? Or is there other oh, no, there's other stuff. There's, okay. um, I think that's a, actually, that's a, a blue, a dark blue or purple mobilia, I think. Um, but th these will spread, self seed. I'm going to have some of these to plant sale for that reason also. Um, but yeah, they're really nice. And this is this is August too, so in August a lot of things are already going by the wayside. Uh, this is great color. I put the hummingbird here because that's almost where they always are. Yeah. They love these. This and the gladiolus are their, are their two favorite things in my part. Here's the purple variety, uh, the blue lobelia. There's a nice, very nice pink color out that's a lot shorter, um, maybe only 20 inches. The jury's still out on this one though. Um, it is more tender and uh, I tried to put it closer and closer to my house but I haven't put it close enough yet because it died over the winter again. So I like the color a lot though. I'm probably going to try one more time to put it right next to the house. And if it dies there then even though it says zone 5 or maybe it's, maybe it's zone 6 on the, on the label, I'm not going to believe it anymore. The, uh, yes, I mentioned these spread, uh, seed themselves, and so do the blue ones. The blue ones are almost invasive. They, they spread quite easily. I haven't seen pests or diseases on these, like a lot of natives. That's why they're natives, right? <laughs> Nothing eats them, and they go their very way. 
Lubins are another favorite. I mentioned the West Country Lubines earlier for Lubins. <coughs> so if you let these reseed themselves, this is what happens. So the color moderates, gets a little paler. There's still, you still get some very nice colors in there, but uh, you lose the more unusual shades like the bright red uh, here, or the bright yellow, or a lot of the light colors that you can see online. So these are um, started from seed mainly. They're easy to start from seed, nice big seeds, robust growth. Uh, and more intense colors here, so these are probably ones from seed. These will, uh, these can rebloom also after the first flush. Uh, a month or so later, they can have secondary blooms. Uh, now, when they're young, uh, deer and rabbits can, will, can chew on them, but once they start to get big, it seems they leave them alone. The main problem I found here was with aphids. You gotta watch these closely for aphids, um, because aphids multiply really quickly, and uh, if you don't catch them. They can swarm the plant and kill it. Uh, but if you can catch it at the right time, which is pretty soon, uh, it's not late April then, but early May, I think. Uh, so just keep an eye on your lupins, and you'll see one or two maybe colonies of aphids just starting to grow. If you just spray those two plants, then you can be free the rest of the season. So it's, timing is very important with that. If once they get out of control and pop just exploding, you can't can't catch up. Oh yeah, the lupins are also interesting because I mentioned it's easy to start from seed. So if you put seeds in the fall, they can come up pretty early and bloom um, in May or June. Um, May or June. But if you put them in the ground in April, then they'll come up and they'll bloom in September. So. If you time it right, you can get lupins through pretty much till the frost. I have not seen any diseases. They, they are short-lived, uh, two or three years. Self-seed, as I mentioned, but the color doesn't hold true. And easy to start from seed. And I'll mention here, <coughs> actually I should have mentioned this with the delphiniums too. Um, it's, Best to start these from seed or from young plants, small plants. Not the big, huge ones that look so great in Lowe's that you, wow, I got to buy that. And I bought a couple of those, but, uh, and I think it has to do with their deep roots. So they're stuck in a pot like this, you put it in the ground, the roots don't get any deeper, and it's probably dead the next year or some a few of these spikes. Uh, you can start from seed or a very young plant, um, they can put down the roots that it wants to, and then it'll. Uh, Last more than more than just that season. Same thing with delphiniums. You don't want to see the delphiniums in, in, in pots like that, but they don't develop the roots more. And they're too old. If you try to bust up the roots, you'll just hurt the plant. So I have a bunch of old uh, beans that I got from last year. Um, the seeds used to be like a good black color. Never. It's like a little more dry. Do you think those are dead or still? Working? I'm pretty sure that if they get a little wrinkled, they're still. Um, sometimes they tell you to soak them for 12 hours to plant them, so you can try that and they'll probably pop up again. I'm sorry, you've got the seeds from your own plants? Yeah. Yeah. So um, they're just wild everywhere. Yeah, I think, I think they're probably fine, but um, if they're wild, you probably have a ton of them still. Yeah, if plant they a few, were, uh, <laughs> you'll get something. Uh, I have a bag full of, I just went around and collected some I'm like, all right, yeah. let's try this. Um, if you have non shriveled ones, use those. But, uh, yeah, no, they're all, they're all in a, like, a Ziploc yeah. bag. And no, I've seen purchased ones that have, some of them are a little they shrivel, look, too. Yeah, so they're, I think they're okay. There's a lot of black, they're a little more gray, as you know, there, so. Well, the seeds do vary in color, too. Some are lighter, some are yeah. dark, even from, well, I'm not sure what plant they came from. Yeah. Now, mullein, um, there's several kinds of mullein weeds that get kind of hairy leaves. You can see by the roadside sometimes. They can get like big and they have yellow flowers up on the spike. 
but there's cultivated varieties as well, and some of these are very nice. This is the one that started me going on these mullanes. Uh, it's kind of a close-up, but so it's a nice lemon yellow, and there's a, a purple center that's hard to see at this angle. You can see it a little more here. So this is from the web, but this is my garden last year. And so you can see it likes to stir rocky soil. So I was digging out a new vegetable garden, and I just threw this dirt over to the side. And then later in the summer, they're coming up like gangbusters. And some of these got this ball. It's not a, a profuse bloom all at once, unlike this web picture. I don't know, maybe some varieties like that. But the other ones, um, they're fairly sparse along the spike. But they keep kept going right from the frost. <coughs> And they're quite hardy too, so these are still blooming in November. So I like that yellow, um, that's butterfly yellow. Uh, there's a bunch of others you can get uh, online of violet, red, pink, white. So I put in a lot of seeds in last fall of different perpascal mullein colors, so I'm gonna see how they do. Drought resistant. Self seeds, yeah, most of these were self seeded from the previous year. <clears throat> so, when do you plant your seeds in the fall? I'm still experiment, experiment with those, but some seeds they like a cold freeze thaw cycle to yeah. break the, the arrow, the coating of the seed. Um, so, definitely in that case, but uh, it seems that lupins are good to do in the fall. Uh, these. I'm assuming good in the fall since I think anything that self self seeds easily is probably good in the fall because that's what you're going to have. Um, and that's that's why I did these because they said most of them are self seeds as well because it, it likes uh, or can take the cold temperatures. Just gotta remember where you put them. Yeah, or yeah, of course or throw them. Like I have some piles that I'm not going to throw any more dirt on. So I threw the seeds out in the and see how it does. But it was pretty amazing. It was more of a rock pile than a dirt pile. It did great. So it was cool. I've seen this even described as a biennial, um, but it's still, it still it seeds so easily, and the color holds true. So you almost don't notice that the, your, your parent plant died. Garden flocks. This is easy to find um, in a lot of places. Quite a few different varieties. Uh, nice fragrance. Um, does have some, and and uh, quite a height range too. This is a good background uh, board plant for gardens, uh, because especially the taller ones can be five feet high. They do get chewed on by deer and rabbits, and later in the season they get mildew on the leaves. Um, if you look online, they say you should thin out some of the stalks that are coming up. Um, to give it more freer airflow to prevent the mildew. Um, I generally don't get around to that, so I may look pretty bad at the other end of the season. But there's some nice colors, and they, they do, the clumps do spread by the roots quite readily. So you get very big clumps. That's another good reason it's a background plant. Um, this is my garden last August, so you can see there's still a lot blooming, and it's like the whole background borders, it's tall flocks. Poppies are great. Um, the orange, of course, is the traditional in the back there, and the most robust. But a lot of the pink varieties are also quite robust and will spread at the clumps. And there's a deep red. Uh, that's not the deep red. That's the kind of in between. But there's all various shades of pink and salmon in between, too. And there's white. Um, at least the orange are very long lived, decades. Um, and don't know about, I don't know about the other ones, the other colors, but probably 10 years anyways. So they're still not, I wouldn't describe them as short lived. At least medium lived and some varieties long lived. Uh, clumps spread slowly. These have interesting seed heads, of course, if you've seen them, they're like knockers. 
are pretty resistant to having seen any diseases, uh, resistant to travel. The only time I've seen the deer and rabbit chew on them is when they're the only thing to eat, right? At the early, very early in the season, or very late in the season. Because you know, the poppies, they'll die back in June, and then they'll put up new growth uh, later in the summer and into the fall. And so sometimes in, even in December, pretty much everything else is dead. But these have still green shoots because they're very hardy. Uh, rosettes of leaves on the ground. And the deer will come along, or the rabbits will come along and eat it. Because they like a, a fresh salad in December. <laughs> I put in some, uh, this is not my garden, but um, I have like the rock crust that I've done. It's called crest because it's edible, I guess. It is. Um, <clears throat> this is just blooming now, uh, so late April into May. It's just short, but it's a nice ground cover. And um, the ubiquitous creeping flocks that everyone has is nice, but it has a certain season. So I like to extend it with various different kinds of ground covers. Uh, this is one of them, the rock crest. Um, the next one also with a rock soapboard, which um, has a later season. And then uh, uh, the creeping veronicas also have been more and more common in, in the stores, and those are nice. I don't have that in this presentation. But. So there's a bunch of different ground covers you can use, so you'll have you know, color for extended or protracted season in, on your walls or in your rock gardens. How long do we want to go, Chilton? Do you want me to stop now? Well, at least till midnight, everybody brought their pajamas, right? <laughs> <laughs> just have, keep on going a little bit longer. All right. You can gong me when uh, <laughs> we'll get the hook. So, because this is just kind of a sequence of plants, we figured we can stop anywhere when we're out of time. Mm -hmm. And then you can request the presentation. You can do the rest at home. And, of course, any questions, you can always email me. Okay, here's the soap board in the garden. So it's these pink clumps. So this spreads very nicely. Uh, the common name is Tumbling Ted. You may have heard it by that name. Um, makes really, really nice uh, ground cover with a lot, of, a lot of nice pink. As far as I know, this is only in pink. Do you know that's native? Do not know. Spreads like it's native, but <laughs> might just be invasive. Uh, it does self seed. So another good one for rock gardens. And salvia. Now this is a, this is a bit like the Nagasaki that we started the perennials with. Um, many of these are desert plants, um, so are drought resistant once established. I again have just, along with the Agastaki, started trying a bunch of different varieties of these, so I'm not sure how well they're going to do or how well they're going to last. Um, but just like the Agastaki, well, of course, at Lowe's you can find all kinds of purples. They're all quite similar, but you know they have different forms, so they're nice. But there's also uh, some much more, uh, should I say, another, a lot more variety of colors as you can find online. Even these are hard to find in nurseries around here. They are rated for the hardening zone in, um, I can tell you from personal experience in Istanbul, they, they have hedges out of this salvia. Because it's perennial, it just, and this was in January, so like, that's the whole year. So they have green hedge and then all these nice red flowers popping out, so it's really cool. Uh, I have not seen diseases or pests on these. Oh, again, like with the Yagasaki, if you're going to buy some through the mail, just check and make sure they're party to the zone. Okay, now we're on to annuals, biennials, and replants. Six, eight, looks like we have eight guys here. Canterbury Bells, this is a biennial. I'm going to have a bunch of these this year because I planted seeds last year. So the first year they just make a rosette from the ground, like some other plants. And the second year they're going to shoot up to about this tall and they'll be laden with blossoms, just like that photo. That's not my house, but 
That is what they look like. They need staking because they're very heavy with the blossoms. That's pretty much the color range you see right there. Um, these are also typical cottage garden plants, as indicated by the Canterbury name. Uh, yeah, the groundhogs did seem to like this one, as I recall, when I last grew it a few years ago. So when it was small, some things would chomp on it. But once they get going, they get really big, and then they can stand a little grazing by a nail. I like bachelor's buttons. This is pretty much the color, color range right here. Very easy from seed. You can get a pack of seeds for 25 cents at the Dollar Tree and throw them in the ground and they'll do great. They do some self-seeding, but they tend to, to die off with time, in my experience. The rabbits, rabbits will eat them and the deer. So for those, I, I use a repellent spray. It's like the garlic and blood meat, I think. It's one of the natural stuff. Dahlias, got to dig them up, but uh, again, a very huge color range. Very large flowers online, it says they can be up to 15 inches. Um, these ones here, I think these were maybe 8 inches, that yellow. Um, but again, anywhere bright red, bright yellow, deep purple, white, orange, really big color range. The, uh, if you have it planted in the tubers, look a little like small yams. Um, and, uh, and they grow very rapidly once you plant them outside in, in May. They get very, very big plants, you know, this high and this much around. But before, they are fairly tender, so the frost will kill them in early October. I'm sorry. Yeah. I started to grow the uh -huh. last year, and I love it, beautiful. But I noticed that, should I keep the top because it gets very Lot, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I mean something like this. Mm -hmm. I, I would have to. You'd have to stake that. Yeah. Very top heavy. You know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they they, they tend to have a lot of leaves. Okay. Yeah. You don't just you have to stake them. I don't think. Okay. There's so much flower. Now the smaller ones, like in the background there, the mm -hmm. pom poms, those may only be that big. Those you may not have to stick, but, but the big head ones, yeah, you do. Uh, when they're small, slugs and snails can chew on the leaves. The only thing I notice with the big plants is you, earwigs like to hide in here, and then they chew the petals and then they'll look so good. Um, but uh, I haven't seen much grazing from, from uh, deer or rabbits. I haven't seen any diseases. But you have the pain of having to dig them up every year and, uh, and replant. This is a cool one. Scarlet flax. Sorry, Glenn. Yeah. I, I have a question around uh, dahlias. Hop, have you found a good way to store them in the winter? What, do you have a I technique? put them in a, like a bushel basket and mm -hmm. stick them in my basement where it runs in the 40s, probably. Just Bear, yeah, or do you put newspaper? Bear, well, yeah, but if you look online, they say, oh, leave it in a little soil or put some um, uh, potting mix on it. Paper back is the best. Yeah, if you keep a little moisture in there, but even though they may look all shriveled up, I found they still they still come up. But if you can keep them with a little moisture, like in a paper bag, actually, that's what I did this last year. Yeah, put it in paper bags um, and based on the top. Keep a little more moisture in there so they'll, they'll stay. But you have to be, uh, mice like to eat them, so you've yeah. got to make sure they're... Okay, I haven't had that problem yet. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we drop ours in uh, peat moss. Peat and moss? And spritz it yeah. you know, to keep it damp or whatever. Yeah. And then, uh, maybe two or three times during the winter. Mm -hmm. Just And as you say, they look, they might look bad at the start of the next year. Yeah. They, uh, I've compared it against new ones and those stored it took about a week longer to yeah to hydrate right yeah sometimes you dig them up they're like you know, huge like this and then next spring I yeah. them down but they do seem to recover 
Um, yeah, you can look online. You know, there's a bunch of different people have different preferred methods. But yeah, I, I was trying the paper bags this year, so we'll see. I haven't looked at it actually, so I need to soon because it's getting planting time. Around May 1st, we start putting those in the ground, even though there might be still frost. They're under the ground, so it doesn't hurt them to get an early start. You can plant uh, dahlias and glads, gladiolus, uh, probably up through July 1st and still get uh, good blooms. If you start getting much later than that, they won't have time to regenerate their bulbs and um, they'll start to decline. So Scarlet Flex, this is an annual now, which is why it's in this section, but a really beautiful red. It's called Scarlet, but it looks deeper, deeper than that to me. They can get up to 30 inches high. Um, so you just start these from seed. Um, I grew these with some success a couple of years ago, um, but what, uh, when I saw a very nice display over in London, right by the sidewalks, it was just a public planting, and they had a whole line of this stuff. It was just spectacular, the floor, the deep red border along the sidewalk. Now, forget me not, some of these are invasive, but this is a look-alike, apparently. The Chinese forget me not. It's a different genus. Um, Misatis, I think, is the the invasive, and I think native forget me not. This is a Chinese forget me not. Looks quite similar though, but you can get a nice mass of blue in your garden, and uh, one crop of these will, will bloom, and then um, I think they put down seed, and other will start coming up. So these aren't quite invasive, but they're bordering on invasive, maybe. But you can get a real nice swath of blue, and if you if you dig up the seeds that it tries to spread, you can. And, uh, keep it under control. They do make very sticky burrs that stick on your clothes and everything. That's how they, one way, one way they spread. It. I thought that was why it was called Forget Me Not, because it'll you take it along and you'll let you be watching TV and say, oh yeah. <laughs> so I tried to see if that was true online and it, it just said it was a token of remembrance. So I think maybe they forgot that online way it was originally named that. They made up a fairy tale. Again, you got to dig them up and replant, um, starting around May 1st, up through July 1st. <coughs> um, this, I would say, I think gladiolus has the widest color range of any of these plants that I'm showing tonight. Maybe any, any, any plant. Uh, there were just all sorts of combinations. There's even green gladiolus. There's yellow. There's red. There's no true blue. There's bluish purples, uh, white. There's some very dark maroon, though there's no true black. But pretty much anything other than that, you can find it. Um, so there's a very gaudy one in the front, and then a more conventional one in the back. And these are great for instant bouquets. You cut like six of these, pop them in a vase, and you're done. So it's cool. Or if you go to a funeral, yeah. Well, that's why it's good to plant in tranches, you know. So if anyone dies over you know, water, like summer period. Um, these make little. Um, they're called corns. Uh, the bulbs. Um, I forget what the difference is, but they, each corn at its base makes a lot of these little corns and. You know, they're only as big as peas, but if you have patience, you can grow those up into full-size gladiolus. And so, and, and there'll be dozens of those at the base of the corn, so you can go in. How long does it take for the ones to grow? I think a couple of years before they bloom. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, so in two years, you could go from one plant to uh, you know, 50 or 100. And the only real pest I've seen with these is thrips. 
which are little not microscopic insects, but they have thin bodies and they're in long and they um, kind of like the aphids, if they get going, they can suck all the juices out and the things are with them, kill off and die. Uh, there's, you can read online how to get rid of fish if you have them. I had it once and it wasn't, uh, I lost some bulbs, some corms. I love the, uh, the um, clumping obelias. Arenas, you can get those just about anywhere. Lowe's, Home Depot, Park Center. And as you know, there's trailing varieties as well as upright compact varieties. In the shade, if you haven't put these in the shade though, because they, they can tolerate sun, and they're like fluorescent in the shade. So I recommend putting them in the shade. It's, it's really cool. Is that your garden? This is, yeah, this is a shade garden. Nice red loop in there. And some this is not my part. Seem to be no, um, no significant pests or diseases that I've noticed. Shirley poppies, again, annuals, you just put seeds down, easy to grow from seed. Bright reds, pinks, whites, black colors. Easy to try, and again, you can get a cheap seed packet. And Throw them out and have a whole bunch of plants in them. They don't Some, like to be moved either, right? Uh, these are just annuals. So, yeah, uh, maybe, I think if they're very young, you can move them because they haven't put the root down, but yeah, the poppies generally have a very deep tap root. It's better to seed them. Yeah, yeah, just seed them and then thin them out. Yeah, that's usually what you do it. Or don't thin them, just let them come up and compete. Okay, so we're here. Okay. So I'll finish since we're this close. So this is just some things I found in sourcing the plants. I've mentioned some of this as we have been going along. Um, I mentioned in some cases you want to buy young plants rather than the big plants like you see in the lows um, because you get better development of the roots. Now sometimes you're having a big party and you want to impress everybody so you buy big things. Stick them in and say, oh, that's lovely. You can do that too. But you won't have it next year. Uh, as far as I can tell, if, if, if you have a group of 12 plants and blows, as far as I can tell, get the biggest one. I'm not even sure that was true because it, it, it runs a little counter to the first point. But if they're all like the same age or the same batch, we found it. As far as I can tell, get the biggest one. I always, I always question the difference. What is the difference when you buy the plants and blows? People or go to Russell's, or go to the North Because um, is the difference with soil or to, like, because um, is the difference five, six dollars, yeah. seven dollars? Yeah, I think generally Lowe's is cheaper because they mass produce. That's Mass. I think the only thing, yeah. Okay. But it's not like, yeah, they put so no, if you find the same variety, yeah, I haven't been able to tell. Sometimes um, they're, they're a little coarse. Uh, yeah, I found that the big guys are already coarse. It could be too early, yeah. Yeah, I have found that. They, they, they're not as careful as the nurseries about labeling stuff. Like sometimes you might get something and it's not really hardy in the zone, but they sell it to you anyway. And the big chain stores, you need to be careful because they'll use like the onycnoids in the soil and whatnot. For the, not great for the bees and stuff. Bees, yeah. Whereas oh. individual nurseries are better about having more oh, organic yeah. yeah. and watering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 people love those. Right. <laughs> it's also fun though to get like reduced plants at loads and then try to bring them back to life. Because when you do it, it's like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Suzanne has the best luck. She gets all the. And sometimes they die. Oh, it's only. I do that. I do that. So as of last year, these were the locations I liked the best because there are. You know, like there's lots of Home Depots around. I think the one in Worcester is the best. And Bellingham was also pretty decent. Uh, I think it's a Home Depot in Shrewsbury. That is okay, but it, so I, I list the best ones here, which is not to say you won't find anything at the others, but uh, these are the best ones. What does best mean? Uh, usually the best selection. Yeah. Okay. Because the prices are pretty much uniform. Sometimes some places will have more rigorous, more liberal markdown, yes. 
uh, practices, but you can't always tell that. Yeah. So yeah. So when I say when I best, it really means selection. Of course, Western Nurseries and Hopkinton, they uh, have a pretty good location in Chelmsford also. That um, full moon coreopsis that I showed, that's okay. I had to go to Chelmsford to get that. They didn't have it in Hopkinton. <coughs> If you haven't been to Mahoney's Rocky Ledge, that's a nice pilgrimage to make. You have to drive to Winchester, which might take 40 minutes. Uh, but it's, it's huge. It's huge, and they have a great selection. Uh, so I recommend that. And Concord's a, a bit smaller, but also decent, Mahoney's. And then Briggs Nursery in Attleboro um, has a little cheaper prices and a pretty good selection as well. And that's where I found that Corydalis with the porcelain blue shade plant. I hadn't seen it anywhere else. Not that I had looked that hard, but that's where I found it. Okay, and here's a summary table that I'm not going to go through, but uh, if you're interested, you can request a presentation. You can look through it. So there's the names of, of the perennials we went through. Mm -hmm. I listed the color range. Uh, what I think is the best way to procure it, either as plants or seeds or young plants, for delphinium and lupin in particular. Uh, bare roots in the cases of, or rhizomes in the cases of irises. And here's some sources that uh, you can try. But in, in, in many cases, there's lots of other alternate methods you can find. But these are the ones that I tried and happy with. And same for the annuals by biennials, these plants. And there's just some more nice plant pictures that aren't Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.